And we're back. Uh, welcome back from the weekend. Uh, today we will continue on uh, and look at considerations uh, for even more complex events. But before we do so, uh, let's go over some of the administrative bits. Reading. Uh, it's only five pages, uh, pages 15 through 20 in the barren text in chapter two, is due by the 10th of this month, a few days away. Please make sure you're keeping on top of the reading. Project number one is out. It has been out. Uh, it is due the 15th of September on at one second before midnight, 11.59, 59 seconds. Please make sure you start right away or else you wait till the last minute, you'll be working like a dog. Okay, so when we last left off, we talked about this idea of systems that are comprised of a bunch of interacting parts. And we use the redundant disk array uh, to motivate our conversation. We developed an expression for the probability that information is saved. And we said at the outset and ex that the disk primary hard drive, the first backup and the second backup, all operate independently, and they maintain these backups, a copy of the primary, and they all run independent from one another, and moreover, the output of one disk does not impact the input of another disk. And so the question asks, if information is saved, what's the probability? And you are given the individual crash rates and calculated the individual run rates for each of the constituent components. And so the long way of doing that looks at the probability of a three-way intersection. We expanded that and we plugged in our numbers and got the expression that the probability information is saved is 99.9996%, which is very small, but not small enough for the probability information is saved. Rather, it's large, but it's not large enough. Generally, you want even better uh, than that in practice. But this was an example, nonetheless, of how you compute the probability of a system given a set of interacting components for which you know the individual mean time before failure, MTBF. Okay, so we also considered a simpler way of doing that by looking at the dual of the probability information that's saved. We looked at the probability that information was lost, and for that, we looked at the probability that the hard drive crashes, and at the same time, the first and second backup crash. And this was to illustrate that in many problems, sometimes it's far easier to compute a probability by looking at one minus, by looking at its negation. And so for information saved, we look at negation and say, what is the probability of say this one minus the probability of information being lost? And so we did that and came up with the same expression. We then looked at this idea of parallel circuits as a way of encoding or describing inter parts that do not interact with one another. We also ended with sequential circuits as a way of modeling uh, a number of parts where the converse is true, the output of one component is directly impacting the input of another component. And we, when we looked at that, we called it a sequential circuit, and we said the probability of information be saved in this case. In our example, we had the first drive was our table of contents, and the second drive was the data disk where the table of contents gave you the location on the data disk where you find information for the file. And so we said for that the probability of information is saved is the probability that two things happen at the same time, that the run event for the hard drive is true, and at the same time the run event for the first disk is also true. And we said that these devices operate independently. And when we say operate independently, here we mean that sending electricity to one does not impact the other but the output of one does impact uh, the output, uh, the input of another. And so here we have the probability of RH and R1, it's just the product of the individuals. We computed that as well. So at this juncture, we have gone over quite a few things. 
We talked about a lot of things about sigma algebra. We looked at our stock and flow diagrams to encode the relationship uh, between interacting parts. We evaluated probabilities. We looked at two-way and three-way probabilities. Uh, we looked at MATLAB and the MATLAB debugger. We took a little bit look at sampling and looked at the stick breaking construction. So we've done a lot of things so far and introduced a lot of vocabulary. Let's continue on and think a little bit more about our sigma algebra. Now, of course, when we talked about sample space for straightforward events, very simple experiments like a single coin flip, it was very easy to think about all the possible events, heads or tails, in our sample space omega coin. And more so when we thought about the possible events of discourse that we might want to describe for a coin, uh, uh, sigma algebra over omega coin, it wasn't very complicated. Well, we looked at the die roll. Instead of a single die roll, we looked at a more complex event involving big N, many rolls of a die. And we computed the cardinality of the sample space, and we devised the scheme for calculating what the size of that sample space is. And so here's another complex problem, and this complex problem involves selecting from a number of alternatives. Now, suppose you wanted to know, for example, the number of football teams that you can form from DSU students consisting of six females and five males in the fall of 2018. That's a lot more complicated to think about. And so we need more machinery or additional machinery from what we've talked about thus far in order to describe the sample space for this example, where you're selecting from a number of alternatives that are available to you. And so at DSU, let's think about a soccer team. A soccer team, in this case, has 10 players and one goalie and also five substitutes, okay. Well, in 2018, DSU consisted of 4,872, 4,872 students, and the breakdown was 60% female and 40% male. So if we're going to go about this in selecting a team, we're going to pick our team members from among that 60% female, 40% male. Okay, so when we want to list out or count all the alternatives we have in sample space, it's not always so straightforward to envision what the events are that we might observe. It can also, in many cases, take a really, really long time to list them out, to enumerate them. Therefore, we need some help here. We need some recipes, some heuristics that are gonna simplify our description. And so the study of counting objects, whether it be they things, events, numbers, et cetera, that's combinatorics, uh, which is part, or you covered as part, in part in discrete math. And so, of course, we said the count is to put a one-to-one -one correspondence with a set of naturals. And you presume some ordering, maybe non-increasing, non-decreasing, lexicographic, or relative to some zero point, starting point. But nonetheless, you order some objects, and now you draw that one-to-one -one correspondence. That's how we count. So we put counts on events in a sigma algebra, and the events also in the sample space. So the events in the sample space, that can help us determine the cardinality for the sigma algebra. It can tell us how rich uh, the sigma algebra is. And so I'm not gonna play this video. I'll make that URL available due to copyright issues, uh, since this is on YouTube. So the question then, how many things? How do you count them? How do you count these complex events? So let's dive in to the main part uh, of today's module. <clears throat> we said that you can have equally likely outcomes. We said that is assigned the description of random. A random experiment is such that all of the alternatives in your sample space will appear per kentum, percentage, uh, the same proportion. So we have our sample space omega, and let's define little n many possible outcomes from your sample space. Now I'm being generic here. We have omega one, little omega corresponds to an event, and these events belong to big omega, which is your sample space. So we have omega one through little omega n. And we have that these things are exhaustive, so the sum of the probability of all these individual events 
is equal to the probability of the entire sample space, which is equal to one. So it is a law of total probability is satisfied. Okay, so in the case of equally likely outcomes, the probability of each event, little omega, is just one upon n, where n is the number of events, i.e. the cardinality of your sample space. Okay, so in order to do this, you have to describe, to make use of this equally likely outcomes, this random uh, situation, you have to be able to describe that no one event is preferred over the other. So when you say something is a fair coin or a fair die, what you're saying is random, equally likely outcomes. And so the simplest solution that we can comprise for thinking about probabilities in complex sample spaces is that we have some number of outcomes in an event. And what we're trying to compute when we say the probability of event, we are trying to evaluate the following proportion. The number of so-called favorable outcomes, what you desire, over the total number of possible outcomes, what is possible in your sample space. So suppose you have some event, and that event consists of some number of outcomes. You can construct that event, the complex event, from among those individual events that collectively define your sample space omega. So in order to compute the probability of that event, well, we would just compute the probability, this is our sigma additivity property, we just compute the probability of the constituent or component events that make up our complex event, we would add the individual probabilities together. So the probability of this event, which is the union between these single events, W1, omega1 through omega t, would just be the probability of omega1 plus the probability of omega2 up to and including plus the probability of omega t. And so this idea of favorable talks about what are all the things you desire? How many events in question are things that you desire when you're expressing a probability? And you divide that by the total number of outcomes that you can observe, which is consequently the sample space omega's cardinality. And so if we were to do this in particular, we'd have 1 over n plus 1 over n plus 1 over n. We sum that together t many times. This gives us t times 1 over n, which is just t upon n. And so alternatively, we can look at the number of outcomes in our complex event E, and we divide that by the number of outcomes in our sample space omega. And so in this case, we have t many outcomes in our complex event E formed by the union of individual events. And the assumption here for this approach is that each one of the individual events from your sample space omega is equally likely. Okay, so then we divide that to compute our proportion, our percentum, when can I see you again? We divide that by the number of outcomes in omega. So this is sometimes abbreviated as the probability is equal to the number of favorable outcomes divided by the number of possible outcomes. So for example, let's pose the question. You roll a die, and we wanted to know what's the probability of getting an odd number of dots. So here's our sample space, omega die, consists of all of the six many outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, and six. If I look at the dense sigma algebra for the die roll, that's the power set. So we have the single events or singletons, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. We also have the doubles, uh, the two-way outcomes, one and two, one and three, et cetera. Uh, we also have the three-way outcomes, one, two, three, one, two, five, including, guess what? One, three, five, and two, four, six, which just happened to be the evens in the case of one, three, five, and the, uh, the evens in case of two, four, six, and the odds in, in the case of one, three, five. So that's odd, and that's the evens. Okay, and so we have our dense sigma algebra, and now if we want to pick out the probability of odd, well, what are we going to use? We're going to use the complex event. We're going to call it omega odd, and omega odd, we can just replace that with that element of the sigma algebra, one, three, five. Those are the odds, and we now decompose that one, three, five as the union of singleton events, and we do the same construction we did on the previous slide. This is just the probability 
of one, union with three, union with five, which is equal to probability of one plus probability of two plus probability of three, which is just one six plus one six plus one six, that's three many times, or three over six, which is one half, or 0.5, which is 50%. Okay, so that's how we compute that. So one of the general questions that we ask is how do we compute the number of favorite events, NF, I'll abbreviate this as NF here, and the number of total events. Because essentially our probability for some event E, we said is gonna be equal to the number of favorable events, what we're looking for, over the number of total events, every possibility that exists. So our sample space often consists of multiple outcomes, like this football team uh, question, often consists of multiple outcomes that are not very easily counted. So how are we gonna do this? We know we now need the number of favorable over the number of total, but we need a way to enumerate them, a recipe for doing this, uh, when it's not so easy to count them. So two big considerations for counting are as follows. Do you replace your selections when you make them, your picks? Uh, do you replace them after selection to the pool of items to be considered or team members? And do you distinguish duplicates? If you have the same composition more than once, do you count each composition? or do you only count a single copy? So let's uh, go further into this. Let's look at replacement after selection. Suppose, and this is our, these are old photos, suppose I were going to form a, a, a three on three football team and I have a number of players, seven players total, and I'm gonna use them to form a football team. Now this is not political statement, this is just some pictures from a couple of years ago. Anyways, so, what does it mean to have a three on three football team? So let's say we have two groups, two teams we're gonna form, and each team is gonna have three players. Now, when you select people from this scheme for three on three, we're gonna alternate between team A picking and team B picking. And let's see what happens. So how many players does team A get on the first pick? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven total players. So team A, has seven different choices they can use for their first selection. So let's say team A picks uh, Tom Brady, has seven choices. Uh, so now look what happens to all of those alternatives that we can pick. It's now reduced by one, we have six choices. So team B's pick, all right, is gonna pick one and they choose uh, Kaepernick. And team B, okay, when does that pick, look what happens to the alternatives that we can choose. And so we now have left five choices, okay? So team A is gonna pick. We have four choices left when team B picks. So team B makes a pick, okay? Now there are three choices left. And you'll notice every time a pick is made, a selection, there's some number of possibilities, but that number of possibilities that remains for the next pick goes down by one, it decrements by one each time. So now team A has two players, team B has two players, and remember it's three on three football team. So team A is gonna make its last pick. It has three choices, makes a pick, okay. That leaves two choices. Team B makes a choice, right? Uh, that leaves one choice. So the question then, do I replace after selection? No, I do not replace after selection. And so when you look at problems involving probabilities that involve making a selection, one of the questions you ask yourself is, do I make a replacement back into, do I place that item back into the pool for, under consideration after I make my selection, yes or no? In this case, it's no. So let's look at another example of making a selection. Let's say you have uh, eight colors and you want to select three crayon colors in order to create a picture. And in this case, it's about a selection of which color you're gonna take. Maybe it's a digital drawing pad like I have here. And every time you select a color, all you're doing is defining a color palette. And that color palette is gonna consist of three different colors that you will use to color. But you do not exhaust or remove 
from the pool of consideration of the eight many colors each time you make a pick. So let's define two color palettes, palette A and palette B, and this is gonna tell you which colors you're using, but it's just a matter of selecting which color, not necessarily um, consuming a crayon. So for the first palette, palette A, you have eight choices. So palette A picks, let's say, purple. Now palette B picks a color, its first color, and it has eight choices because we have not removed from consideration any of the colors as a result of selecting a color for palette A. So now B makes a choice. Let's say B picks red. Okay, now it's A's turn again. And remember, it's three colors or three crayons uh, for a color palette. A has eight choices. A makes a pick, it picks orange. B has eight choices. B picks, say, purple. Okay, um, now it's A's choice again. A picks yellow. And then lastly, B makes another choice, has eight choices. B picks green. So there's my color palette A, purple, orange, yellow. Color palette B is red, purple, green. And you'll notice here, each time a palette had a selection, after making that selection, the number of crayons did not decrease. You did not eliminate or remove or, de or decrement by one the number of available colors in a particular color palette. And so the other consideration, when you make selection, this idea of does the set of objects for the next pick decrease over time is called with replacement or without replacement. That's the consideration for replacement. With replacement means, that's the, the, the color palette example, when you sample an item, that item or selection you make is replaced back into the initial set. And with that, the number of available alternatives for each pick, each selection, does not go down. It stays the same. Without replacement means that the sampled item is removed from further sampling, so the number of possibilities for the next pick is reduced by one. All right. So let's look at the other consideration, the other consideration, do I distinguish duplicates? All right, so in this example, 2.2.3 in the Baron, the main text, a family is planning to have two children. And so one question one might ask, maybe you're a geneticist, what is the probability of having two girls? Okay, well, let's think about this. There are three different possibilities that you can have for two children within a family. You can have two girls, okay? You can have two boys, okay? Or you can have a girl and a boy. So what if we did this and we said the probability of having two girls is therefore, well, one out of three, that's equal probability, that's one divided by cardinality of three, that's one third, okay? And you celebrate and go off. Well, that's not correct. So let's think about why that's not correct. So let's look at Omega gender. And omega gender is going to describe all the possible outcomes of the gender of a child. There's female, okay, and there's male. Now let's assume that each outcome, male, female, is equally likely, and each birth is independent. And independent meaning that the outcome of one birth does not impact or influence in any way the outcome of another birth. Well, that's true. So let's see what can happen with two children. You have two girls. So you say female, female, okay? Female followed by female, wonderful. You have two boys. Well, let's see, that's male followed by male, okay? Let's look at the other two alternatives. The first child is a girl, so female, followed by second child is a boy, that's male. Or you could have the first child is a boy, that's a male, followed by female, the second child. So if we were to look at the probability of two girls, well, we know that the probability of a girl equally likely, so that's one over the cardinality of omega gender, that's one over two or 50%. So we have probability of female and female, okay, they're independent, so we multiply product of female times product of female, that's one and a half times one and a half. Oh, wait a minute, that's one quarter. That's not equal to one third. So let's think about this, why that difference exists. So if we were to look at sample space of a complex event, omega two children, 
Well, what are the elements of that sample space? We can have female, female, male, male, female, male, male, female. So if we look at this and we think about the cardinality of this sample space representing two children, it's almost like flipping a coin two times. One side of the coin is female, the other side is male, and we flip it one time for the first child born and another time for the second child born. So if we look at this, well, the alternatives are that's two girls, that's two boys, that's girl first, then boy, and then boy first, then girl. Okay, so if we were to look at this one quarter, it's different. And now if we were to think about the cardinality of two children, well, if we look at the probability for that random event, one over the cardinality of two children, is equal to one over four, which is 25%. So that's what our difference is. In the former, we weren't distinguishing the order. We said that if you have a girl and a boy, it's the same, regardless of if the girl is first, the boy is second, or the boy is first and the girl is second. So this is not entirely correct. What this leads us to is this idea of do you distinguish duplicates? Because remember, an event is a set, right? And what property does a set have? A set says that you have unique collection of elements. So one of the questions you ask yourself is the order, does it matter? Do duplicates, are they distinguishable? So that means that situation we can have the boy followed by the girl or the girl followed by the boy absolutely in set notation or it does not matter but when you write them out are you for your particular problem when you're making a selection does the boy being born first and the girl being born second is that not equal to the girl first boy second or are they equal to so if they're not equal to one another boy girl girl boy then that's called distinguishable. That means the order matters. So in any case, if you look at the events, if the order matters, then male, female is not equal to female, male. So you count them as being unique, okay? If they're indistinguishable, that means the order doesn't matter. For the order doesn't matter, that means that male, female is equal to female, male. And what you're doing there is you're looking at the identities that are in that collection and not which one came first or which one came second. It's a really important consideration when you're trying to count your events. So let's go forward and look at this idea of sampling with replacement. That's the crayon example. Every si sampled item is replaced back into the initial set. If it's a random experiment, any object can be selected with probability one over n, one upon n, at any time. That means equally likely random and objects may be selected more than once and you replace. So that's like the crayon example. So if you have multiple events in some arrangement that you're trying to form, the so-called permutation is the set of all possible arrangements or distinguishable selections of K objects from a set of N objects. So for example, select five cards from a full deck. You can have permutation with replacement, okay? That means you are looking at the type of card you select, but you put it back in like crayon uh, for, to, the, to the pool of, under consideration. Or permutation without replacement, where you take the card and put it down in front of you, like you're forming a hand in some card game. So let's take a look at permutation with replacement. That's the crayon example. Uh, the notation mathematical is, mathematically, is PR, permutation, of K objects. So here's the objects selected out of N objects. This is the total size of the pool, where the pool is what I'm referring to as the total group from which you're making your pick or your selection. So what do you do? Like the crown example, if we we're gonna pick K many times, we saw K is three, 
each time the number or the size of the pool under consideration did not change, it stayed the same. So for the first pick, we have n many choices. For the second pick, we have n many choices, up to including the case pick, we have also n many choices. So I pick k many times, and each time I have n choices. So we multiply them together, n times n times n times n k many times, we get n to the k power. Uh, and that is the number of alternatives that I have. Okay, so let's look at permutation without replacement. That's the three on three football team. And we said each time we make a pick, on the next round when we make a pick, the number or the pool is gonna decrease by one each time. So K is the number of picks or the size of the teams. And N is the initial size of the pool. Now, it's really important you pay attention to initial because that pool is gonna change, okay? So we're gonna make K picks, all right? So the first pick, we have N choices. It reduces by one. Second time we make a pick, reduces by, uh, it's N minus one, it reduces by one. The third time, it's N minus two, and so forth, up to and including the case time we pick, it's N minus K plus one uh, is the number of choices that we have. Okay, so if we were going to express the number of possible ways I can pick k objects, the number of picks, out of a pool of n many, where I do the selection without replacement, that's gonna be the product of all these terms. It's n times n minus one times n minus two, dot, 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 times n minus k plus one. So if I write that out compactly, that's n factorial over n minus k factorial. And let's look at where that comes from. Well, if we do this n factorial, right, to say n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 dot, dot, dot times n minus k plus 1 times, you know, if the next one, n minus k plus 1, that's n minus k times n minus k minus one dot 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 times two times one okay that's in our numerator that's n factorial and if we look at n minus k factorial that's n minus k times n minus k minus one dot 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 times two times one okay so if we look at this expression, well, this is n factorial. This is n minus k quantity factorial. And if we look at this, oh, wait a minute. Well, let's look at this term here, these terms. That's equal to n minus k quantity factorial. We know that these terms, that's equal to n minus k quantity factorial. We have n minus k quantity factorial in the numerator and in the denominator, they cancel they go to one when they cancel, because anything over itself is one. And we're left with, oh, wait a minute, we're left with n times n minus one times n minus two dot, dot, dot times n minus k plus one. It's exactly what we had at the outset. And so this is so-called permutation without replacement. It says you're making a selection, and each time you make that selection without replacement means that the pool is going to change after each pick. It decrements by one. Okay. So let's take a look at when we make a selection of K objects out of a total of N choices, and it's indistinguishable from a set. That's called combination. And combination can be written many different ways. C and K, where K is the number of picks or selections for arranging objects, and N is the number, number of initial objects. Okay. We might also write this combination using this parenthesized expression 
and that's called N choose K. You pronounce it N choose K. And in this particular case, the things you pick are indistinguishable, right? Uh, that means the order does not matter. And so what is the expression for N choose K? It's N factorial over N minus K factorial. And then we have this extra term, one over K factorial. Well, if we only look at this portion, N factorial over N minus K factorial, that looks like our permutation, right? And it is a permutation. The extra part, this one over K factorial, you're accounting for the fact that the K objects that you pick can be arranged in some number of ways. So let's take a look at an example to motivate this. So suppose you have a population of 1,000 women and 800 men. And the question is, how many soccer teams can you form that consist of six women and five men? Now, does it matter what the names of the women are? No, it does not. What matters is that they're women. So the order in which you pick these women does not matter. What matters is the fact that their membership, uh, that they're women. And likewise, for the five, the order doesn't matter. So here is woman number one, woman number two, three, four, five, and six. Likewise, here's man number one, number two, three, four, and five. Now, of course, once you pick a group of women, well, you could arrange them any way. There's some number of orderings of the women that you pick, the six. And because they're indistinguishable, the order where you have woman one, two, three, four, five, six, you might have woman one, two, three, four, five, six. You might have woman six, woman five, woman four, woman three, woman two, and woman number one, right? These two are equal to one another. You're not distinguishing the order. So we need to divide by something to take out of that count the number of women represented by all possible arrangements of these sex. Okay. So the selections of women we have, that's our permutation, right? This is that P that we talked about, uh, where we're looking at permutation uh, without replacement, right? So we're going to pick a woman. When we pick what first woman, we're left with uh, 999. Pick the second one. We're left with 998 and 997 and so forth. So we first have to look at the selections that we can make, and then we need to fix it up by removing the number of arrangements for those six women. <coughs> Excuse me. And we do the same thing for the men. So it does not matter which woman is selected, so the order does not matter. So given that you have six women, you can have them in six factorial arrangements. Why? Because for the first one, okay, if you have six women, for the first one, you have six choices, then five, then four, then three, then two, then one, for a total of six factorial. And so you have to have those multiple arrangements of six individuals. You have to factor them out of your computation uh, for the number of, arra of arrangements without replacing them. Okay, so for the six women, we have six factorial possible ways of arranging them. For the five men, we have five factorial possible arrangements. And so we do this, let's say, for the men and the women, uh, and there is our response. So let's do this for the men and the women. So that's permutation, the selection without replacement, we said from before, is n factorial over n minus k factorial, and we're gonna multiply by one over k factorial, okay? Uh, so we're gonna do this for the women, and we do the same thing for the men. So here, for the women, okay, we said there are 1,000 women, 800 men. We're gonna pick out of that 1,000, six women, and we're gonna pick out of the 800 men, five men. So we have 1,000 over 1,000 minus six quantity factorial. That's the permutation. We multiply by one over k factorial. That's one over six factorial. For the men, we have 800 factorial over 800 minus 5 factorial. That's our permutation here. Uh, and then we multiply that by 1 over 5 factorial. 
for all the possible arrangements of the map. So we take these two factors, we multiply them together, and that's the number of soccer teams we can form from a population of 1,000 women, 800 men, given the team has six women and five men. Okay, so we could also note it as follows. We say 1,000 choose six times 800 choose five, and that's the so-called combination, and we pronounce that as choose. All right. So here are some properties of combination. Combination and n choose k. Formulaically, we write n factorial over n minus k factorial. That's the permutation part, the selection without replacement. And then we factor out those multiple arrangements of that those k many objects selected. So we get n factorial upon n minus k quantity factorial uh, times one over k factorial. Some basic properties of combination, uh, the number of ways of, of n choose zero, there's only one way to do it. n choose one, how many ways can you choose one? Well, n many times. And then the combination n choose k is the same as n choose n minus k. And I'll leave it to you uh, to actually work out the math of this one, right? It falls out very, very naturally. And this is without replacement. But what happens if you have with replacement? Well, with replacement says, all right, well, I choose some selection. The order is not important, so they're indistinguishable. And in this case, because it's with replacement, like the crayon example, uh, each one can be sampled more than once. So you can have multiple representation more than once. And so let's imagine a different scenario with these balls and sticks, the balls are going to be used to represent each one of those picks, right? The K-many balls. And each of these vertical bars is going to be a bin. And between vertical bars is going to represent a choice, right? So the bar is going to separate different choices. So if we have N different objects, well, we're going to have N spaces to the left or to the right of a bar. So that means we're going to have, here's a space, here's a space, here's a space, up to and including the nth space. So if we have n objects, right, n different possible selections we can make, so k is the number of picks, n is the initial number of possible objects. So in the case of the crayon example, we had a color palette of size three and we had eight crayons. So here in this construction, each one of these spaces is gonna represent a possible object. So we're going to have the first one, the second one, the third one, up to including the nth object. So if this is the nth object for this space. So in order to represent spaces to the left or right of these sticks uh, for each one of the object pos uh, possibilities that you can select, uh, you're going to need n minus 1 sticks. So we have n minus 1 sticks defines n spaces to the left or to the right of the stick, and each space represents an object category. So now, you imagine there's somebody here, my artwork is not going to win any awards, and you're going to throw a ball, and that ball is going to come to rest in one of these spaces. When a ball comes to rest in one of the spaces that represents one of the picks that you make is that particular object or that crayon, right? So I throw k many of these balls, and when I throw k many of these balls, you're going to end up with k of these balls. So k balls is going to are going to end up in these spaces. So let's say you know um, two of the balls ended up in this space, one of the balls ended up in that space, but you could have zero balls in some of the other spaces. So how we represent zero balls is that we just have an empty space 
to the left or to the right of, or that bin or that object category, that possible possibility for an object, that means there's no ball there because we didn't select it when we tossed the ball. Likewise, we can have a ball between the space, between two of the sticks. That means that for one of my K picks, that particular alternative was selected, a selected alternative. Okay, <clears throat> so we have a scheme here of saying sampling with replacement. Each time we have the same number of alternatives and how we represent those K picks is by throwing K balls and these balls come to rest somewhere in this figure in one of the spaces representing a possible alternative from the big N, from the N, many possible objects that we had in our pool under consideration. Okay, so if we do that now, what we're left with is the total number of both balls and sticks that we can put in some arrangement. And what is the total number of balls and sticks that we can put in arrangement? Well, this is our expression. So how many possible balls and sticks do we have? We said we have K balls, so that's the first ball, that's the second ball, that's the third ball, up to and including the K ball, because we just got done saying that we have K many balls. And we have N minus one sticks. There's the first stick, S1, second stick, S2, up to and including the N minus one stick. So we have a total number of K plus N minus one, the number of balls and the number of sticks. Now, if we compute k plus n minus 1 factorial, that gives us the number of arrangements that you can have of this total group of objects, k many balls and n minus 1 sticks. Now, of course, let's not distinguish which particular ball, because if we have ball number one, ball number two, that's the same as ball number two, ball number one. So we don't care about the particular arrangement once we lay them out. We just care about their position, which space they appear in. So likewise, we don't care about which stick, right? If we have stick two and stick three, we don't care if it's stick three and stick two. We don't care about the relative position. So essentially, we take all the possible arrangements and we divide by n minus one, because we don't care about the particular order, indistinguishable order of the sticks, an indistinguishable order of the balls. So this gives us the expression for combination with replacement, where we are on each round of picks, we have the full big N many possible objects is the size of the pool under consideration. Okay, so we use the space between sticks as our slots, the space is defined each possible choice and the position of the ball K balls is each of those K many choices. So here, two times we had that first choice. One time we made that second choice. Uh, three times we had that fourth choice, etc. Okay, and this is called combination with replacement. All right, so let's go forward uh, to MATLAB, and MATLAB has tools that will actually calculate uh, our combination and our permutation. And I will leave that to you uh, to go to MATLAB, look at the help, and try an example. There's lots of wonderful help available. Uh, and with that, uh, I will end there. That's all I had for today's segment. Uh, please make sure you're keeping up with the reading, and please make sure you are working on project number one. Uh, next time, when we meet on Thursday, uh, we will start with conditional probability uh, and independence. Uh, so as always, please stay healthy and stay safe. I'll see you Thursday.